This isn't where it started, but I'm starting it here. I'm with my girlfriend in her car. We're driving along for a day together, and we're fighting. The fighting is going pretty intensively, enough that I'm starting to feel a little pain. That little bit of pain turns into more pain and more pain until the arguing stops because she's noticing that there's something wrong with me, and I'm telling her I feel awful. We turn around, we, we go back to her house, and I'm on her couch. I've moved from being a little in pain to being a lot in pain. I'm screaming. I'm not at all happy, and she is desperately trying to find something in the house that can help. The pain is intense, and it's coming from somewhere inside my body, and I can't do anything to change it. I can't shift and have it feel less. It's whatever direction I'm in, it hurts. And she gives me something to drink, which might help, but she starts looking things up in the medical books and discovers that if the problem is my appendix, then my appendix will almost certainly burst because I've drank this. She looks at me and she starts crying and she says, oh my God, I've killed you. And she runs upstairs to her bedroom ostensibly to cry away while her boyfriend dies. I actually don't die, but this is where the story starts. It's ten years long, and while it has a happy ending, it was one of the roughest roads I've ever traveled. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. The story starts in my girlfriend's car, but the history starts a year or two before that. At that time, I'm working at Focus Studios, and because I was evicted from my rent control apartment, I was living very close to Focus Studios in Central Square in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It was a ramshackle apartment. I know this because I look back at the memory of when the pain started that morning, and I am waking up on a mattress on the floor in a tiny little room with pillows representing all of my covers. What happened is that I woke up with an incredible amount of pain in my foot. It was jammed in between parts of my bones. I couldn't place it. All it really felt like was that I had somehow broken my foot in my sleep. It was a pain that moved throughout the foot, but it was concentrated around my toes. It really did feel, in every single way, like I had somehow smashed my foot in my sleep and was waking up with broken toes. I looked at my foot, there was nothing about it that seemed off, but I couldn't walk. I would stand up on one foot and stumble, fall over again, and I edged myself over to the room that had the phone, called my girlfriend, and asked if it was possible for her to take me to the hospital. She showed up, and we went to the nearest hospital. It was a weekday, so the hospital was pretty quiet, and I remember eventually going to a doctor, taking my x-rays, and then talking with me. And what he said to me was, you know, everything you're doing shows the symptoms of gout, but that doesn't make any sense. You're way too young to have any gout symptoms. So I'm going to give you a couple crutches and a few drugs, and maybe that will help you until you get better. I stumbled out relearning crutches, and the first thing that happens with crutches is that your shoulders hurt, and you feel really weird, and, and two or three days later, I did feel well enough to discard the crutches and get on with my life. As far as I could tell, that's where it all began. Over time, I would occasionally feel a little pain here, a little pain there, but I just assumed it was something minor, something that couldn't get in the way, and so why even bother them? But that car ride, that was a whole other thing. When I was lying on that couch, I felt pain 
pain that I had never experienced before. It's so hard to describe pain. You either experienced it at some point and you're pulling on your memories or somebody's just describing a situation and you acknowledge it. Like if somebody describes a particularly difficult time in their lives or a really, really cool game they're playing, you can sort of understand what they're saying, but the descriptions always fall next to the experience. The way that I've described this pain portion of my life is that it was a kind of pain where you stopped thinking of yourself as a person. You started to focus only on the nerve endings on fire and your mind wishing to come up with some way to not be there. Anything in the room becomes fascinating because you just start focusing on patterns and meanings and trying to find some sort of mental escape from the unescapable. The pain that I would feel in my gut was like being slowly stabbed, like somebody was putting a knife into me. Over time, I started to have these attacks. And what made them awful was the fact that my recovery afterwards was so quick and so complete that I would not really pursue figuring out why it was happening or what was going on. I would just take the pain and then get on with my life. I look back now at the pure recklessness of living this way. At some point, I really should have worked it out with a doctor years before I did. I'll say right now, please don't think that way. See doctors, see multiple ones if you have to, get opinions, move on it. But I didn't. Over time, we figured out what this was. It was kidney stones. I was forming stones in my kidneys from elements in my bloodstream, and they would build up over time, and then one of them, when it was large enough, would break free, go down through my system, and get stuck in a random tube. At that point, it would start to hurt incredibly. Sometimes the stone was sharp and it would cut the insides of my body. Other times it would just block it, seal off the tube, and the resulting pain was immense until the pressure built up and it broke down. So there's multiple therapies for kidney stones. You drink a lot of cranberry juice, you avoid certain foods, you try not to build up these substances, and then, well, the kidney stones will probably never come back unless they do. All throughout my late 20s and early 30s, kidney stones just became part of my life. I would live a normal life, have a job, have relationships, do travel, get involved in projects, you know, being alive, and then I would start to hear a note coming from my gut, and I knew that I was on the edge of another stone. If you've had kidney stones, you, you know all this, but the number one thing you should do if you start to feel something like a kidney stone is drink water. Drink an enormous amount of water, more water than you could ever imagine. Imagine that they have now outlawed water and you're trying to smuggle it over the border and you are drinking a quart of it. Just push water. I can't stress that enough. Irrigation is key. But even then, the chances are the stone will get stuck. I have a lot of memories of kidney stone attacks throughout that part of my life. Sometimes the kidney stone was extremely small and I would just pass it, see that I passed it, and go, oh, well, that's good to know. Another time it would start to feel painful and I would just search for the nearest bed or place I could sit down, start drinking water, and inevitably end up screaming, clutching my sides, and hoping beyond hope that this one wasn't going to be in some way fatal or permanently damaging. There was a trip I took across the country, and in Newark, New Jersey, I was in the airport, and I started to have one, and I was lying on the floor of the airport waiting room 
with an attendant who I will always think of as an angel who sat there on his knee, holding my hand, gripping it while I went through the worst of it until I was loaded into an ambulance and looked at by one of the worst doctors I've ever experienced. I'm going to go into that for just one second. If you've ever seen Minority Report, there is a sequence where the main character has his eyes replaced because he's trying to avoid biometric scanning. And the doctor that our main character gets turns out to be a criminal who had gone to jail for medical malpractice and now found himself in a beautiful revenge position. He speaks really oddly and says all sorts of scary things, but ultimately he does do the job. And this guy gave off the exact same vibe. He had all of the emotional connection to the medical profession that a mechanic would have working on a friend's car for free. My night with that guy, my adventure, could be summarized by when he took my saline bag and put it on top of a piece of equipment that he was using to measure me, and I looked on with horror as the bag started to fall off of the machine. It started to move slowly, then faster, and then it fell off the machine. And I grabbed it and caught it in my hands, this bag that was leading to a tap in my arm and would have ripped it out. And I looked at him incredulously, and he said, well, it can't happen a second time, and he put it back up on the machine. Well, there were lots of other times that medical folks were empathetic and caring and really tried to help me work through this, but it really felt like kidney stones and the attendant feelings of gout, because it was gout, were going to follow me for the rest of my life. In my late 30s, I encountered a doctor who methodically worked with me to figure out what was wrong. And what was wrong? was that I didn't know. There are two different types of kidney stones. One type, which is 95% of all kidney stones, is made of calcium. So you want to avoid foods that build up the calcium in your system because it's solidifying in your kidneys and creating these stones. The other 5%, which includes the ones I was having, are made of uric acid. In other words, the acid in your urine that the kidneys are building up. The therapies between calcium stones and uric acid stones are completely different. In the case of uric acid stones, you don't want to drink cranberry juice. You're actually adding to the problem. You don't want acidic foods. What you want instead is a way to knock down the acidity of your blood. And the way that you knock down the acidity of your blood is 300 milligrams of allopurinol. From the moment I started taking allopurinol, and I have taken allopurinol for about 15 years, the kidney stones stopped. Oh, I would occasionally pass some very tiny, tiny stone somewhere, but it was absolutely out of my life. It literally cured me. It is such a delight to find out that one simple pill taken daily can change a terrible part of your life and remove it completely. The simple addition of this drug ripped away an entire component of how I lived my life. I guess I'm saying there, if something in your life is negative and chronic, keep seeking therapies. It's discouraging to try something and not have it work. It's even more discouraging if it requires months of effort to find out if it even is working. But the chance of it working is worth everything. And if you have the ability and the time, I'll testify, it made an incredible difference in how I live. There were a lot of interesting side effects to having incredible racking pain be a part of my life. One of them is that my tolerance for pain is now ridiculous. Luckily, over time, it's faded a bit, but it used to be that I would go into the hospital and they would show you their pain chart, saying on the rating of 1 to 10, how much pain do you feel? And I would say to myself, 
Well, for me, it's a five, but I'll bet to them it's an eight or nine. So I would say eight or nine because I no longer could feel pain the exact same way. I can really hurt myself and keep going. It's not a talent that I like. It's not a skill I wanted to build up, but it's there. Another side effect during those years was an incredible amount of gratitude on days I didn't have the pain. If I wasn't stuck in bed, miserable and screaming, that was a gift handed to me. I think people have a lot of methods to keep themselves mindful of knowing that a day without tragedy or pain is a special day, but that's what did it for me. I would get a lot done on days that I wasn't feeling miserable. So I had a lot of production work in documentaries and textfiles.com and everything else I was doing simply because I was delighted that I could sit there and make things happen. It was a true and honest gift, and I loved having it. A third thing that happened was that I completely changed my relationship to hospitals. I didn't have a problem going to emergency rooms. I wasn't bothered talking to a range of doctors. I also knew there were good doctors and bad doctors and doctors that just simply didn't care and made the easiest choices and didn't really research it. And so I would have to research it. I became more self-reliant, more self-aware, and knowing that the patient was part of the chorus of voices and not merely a passive person listening to what others decided for them. I contradicted, I agreed, I listened, and I didn't listen. But it came from a place of knowledge, and it came from a place of knowing that I needed to take care of myself first if I expected anybody else to. It has to be over a decade since I've had to deal with any major kidney stones. They're rapidly fading in my memory, which is where they should be. I remember the moments of pain still, but the images become fuzzier, become duller. They don't bother me anymore. And I like to think, in some small way, that having those problems and running as I had to to medical doctors and having myself checked out was a factor in agreeing that we needed to see medical attention when I was in Australia and I had what turned out to be a heart attack. Instead of telling myself I would just power through it and I didn't feel good and it was something I ate, I ended up seeing doctors when it mattered. Maybe, in the aggregate, that's the gift that kidney stones gave to me. Although I, and all the people who've been in my life through this, probably wished it could have wrapped it a little better. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to Forrest Fuqua, James Bakoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Scott Roseanne, Scott McGrady, Joshua Stein, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. One side effect of going to so many emergency room visits was that I became very aware of health insurance and how important that was to getting things done. When I was going through my early 30s, I worked for a company that gave me health insurance that was pretty generous at the time, enough that I didn't really think about medical bills at all. I'd go to an emergency room, give them all my credentials, I had some sort of card with me, I'd hand them the card, and then later I'd be sent some tiny bill that at the time I assumed was Q-tips and Band-Aids, and then never think about it again. Obviously, that changed when I didn't have medical insurance and things that would represent minor charges in my life would become ten or $20,000 in no time at all. Medical insurance was one of the main reasons that we ended up bringing me on as a full-time employee at the Internet Archive. I could have been an independent person being paid as a contractor, but it was much better for me to have health insurance. That would come from these incredible emergency room bills that I would get. Obviously, medical debt has bothered me here or there, mostly involving very expensive procedures I've needed, many of which may come in the future for me. Uh, who knows what life holds? But I do know one thing. 
it never pays to put off medical care. Tay Zonday, who wrote Chocolate Rain and became a sensation in memes for doing so, once wrote a very insightful tweet talking about poverty. Poverty, he said, charges interest. A toothache now that you don't handle becomes a root canal. A back injury becomes spinal surgery. And if you put off medical attention, it only gets worse. I don't know if that's advice people can follow, but please let my years of pain and the moments at which I could have been gone, but I was saved by an attentive doctor and even more importantly, attentive friends, maybe convince you otherwise. <laughs>